we'd like to go ahead and get started with the second panel. So I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to uh, this panel uh, titled The Collected Campus. And um, one of the, I'd like to explain something like the rationale for this panel. You know, there are all kinds of quirky and unusual things uh, on this campus such as the antique clocks in University Hall and other administrative buildings that a lot of people have told us about. Um, uh, these are tremendously interesting to learn about, uh, but equally surprising to uh, myself and Julie were the ways in which assemblages of things at Harvard really came to life or could be viewed through an entirely new lens once the term collection was applied to them. Uh, this pertains to everything from, uh, as you'll see in this uh, panel, the buildings on campus to uh, the uh, landscaped uh, spaces on campus to, um, to the portraits on campus. Uh, so in that spirit, I'd like to introduce our, our three speakers uh, today. I'd like to introduce them all at once and then ask them to come to the podium uh, one after the other. And I'll introduce them in reverse order of presentation. So the last speaker of the panel I'll introduce first. Uh, he is Stephen Coit. Uh, who has uh, since 2002 been the official portraitist to the Harvard Foundation's Portrait Project. And that means he's, among other things, he's painted 17 uh, portraits uh, in and around campus, uh, everyone from the uh, Harvard 17th century Native American alumnus Caleb to President Drew Faust. He's currently painting the portrait of Richard T. Greener, uh, Harvard's first African American alumnus in 19, uh, 1870. Uh, our uh, second speaker for the panel is Michael von Falkenberg, who is the Charles Eliot Professor of Practice uh, in Landscape Architecture at the Graduate School of Design here. Uh, he's also the head of Michael von Falkenberg Associates, which he founded in 1982, and they have, um, he has uh, designed and conceived of over 350 projects, everything from the Brooklyn Bridge Park to the uh, Wellesley College campus plan to uh, the restoration of Harvard Yard. Uh, our first speaker for the panel uh, is my distinguished colleague in the history of architecture at, the, at, at Harvard in the history of art and architecture department, uh, Professor Joseph Connors, who uh, has previously served as the director of the American Academy in Rome and uh, the Villa Itadi. Uh, it's hard to think of a better person to address the topic of Harvard's architecture. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you. Uh, the origins of this talk are the wish to incorporate the Harvard Yard, the old yard, into the large introduction to architecture course that I'll be taking over next year, twinning it with Central Park. Um, I want the students to feel that each time they walk through the yard, which they do dozens of times a day, that they are really seeing something new every time. My favorite quote is from Bernard Berenson, who after hundreds of times walking up the same hillsides in Fiesole would come back to his family and say, where were my eyes yesterday? And I hope that they will be saying that too. To someone who has spent 20 years teaching at Columbia, the ideal campus is designed by a single mind or a very close set of minds, architect and patron, focuses on a great Hagia Sophia or Pantheon, is enclosed from the outside world by a fence, is built of the same materials uh, for every building with light variations, uh, and is so symmetrical that the one building that has been left out of the master plan, the symmetry for Avery Library, is still called on campus the missing tooth. When you come to Harvard, it's obviously totally different. Um, Harvard, you see here where, for instance, the Smith Center now is outlined, uh, was a small, very small village, uh, the village of Newton. Um, we know a lot about the early history of Harvard thanks to the fact that in the 300th anniversary, the so-called centennial, an enormous amount of scholarship was done on Massachusetts and all the small towns on the campus and the three volume history of Harvard was finally presented after many years of work by um, Samuel Elliott Morrison to the trustees uh, who were a little shocked that these three enormous volumes went up to and included 1698. Um, in any case, it's from this that we know, or I know so much about the origins of the university. It began uh, with uh, um, the purchase of a house that was four or five years old, the Paintree House. I encircle also the meeting house uh, 
uh, which is the new meeting house later in the 17th century, but always available, except that Harvard didn't, chose not to use it. The old ship church in Hingham gives us still a good idea of what that meeting house looked like. To envisage where Harvard started, you go to the gate with the wonderful, sadly, well, the wonderful ode of Horace on it, which praises eternal marriage, it's the last line of his most misogynistic poem against his mistress Lydia, but in any case, it's a beautiful line. Uh, you see where the pain tree house was and its lot or yard for uh, obviously farming and cattle grazing, abutting on the ox yard to the north looked something like this. The pain tree house was first used and then Harvard Hall, demolished 40 years later, was built on the back of the, lo on the, back of the lot. If you look Closely at the gate, very nicely, uh, an inscription commemorates the second house, the Goff House or the Goff College, which occupied a long similar lot uh, on which, the back of which the Indian College was built. So by 1640 or so, Harvard had four buildings, three of which were in wood, and one, the Indian College, not of course used by Indians, but by the press. Uh, and this is just to remind you of things on the right, the Wadsworth House of the 1740s is still there, and you can get some idea, as I said, of the, um, of the meeting house. Now, old Harvard was reconstructed in the 1930s by Morrison and Shortlev, and it's where all of the great events of the early history of the university took place. Uh, this is their idea of a kind of Tudor mansion. Um, it's a time when Harvard was suffering the great remigration of Puritans back to Puritan England, which they now found sympathetic, finally. Half of Harvard graduates went back home uh, before 1660. So it's a time of lowering enrollments and so forth. Nonetheless, um, it was thought fitting that a college be built for the multitude of persons cohabiting for scholastical communication, whereby to actuate the minds of one another. So living together and learning together is the spirit. However, it was not big enough and it was very rickety. The area I've outlined on the right faced, uh, backed on the ox pasture and looked over to the cow common, and of course is where the famous three original buildings of Harvard, the so-called quad of Harvard was built. Um, this wonderful Burgess Price view of 1726 shows what he calls the colleges, because they're all called a college. Harvard Hall number two, or Harvard College number two was on the left and it's where many great events in the history of the university took place. It's where John Harvard's library was put, for instance, and there was a philosophical chamber and a philosophical cabinet, I think, which we'll learn more about. Uh, in any case, the quad, something like the three-sided quad, something like Emanuel College, Cambridge, was built counterclockwise uh, from the second Harvard Hall in 1670, uh, time of war with the Indians, but uh, still built to uh, 20 years later, Stoughton Hall, number one, which is not named for the Israel Stoughton, who was the perpetrator of the genocide against the Pequots, but for William Stoughton, who was the hanging judge at Salem, proving you could count on the Stoughtons, uh, to finally Massachusetts Hall of uh, 1719, which is always pointed out as the oldest building at Harvard, but it's salutary to remember that it's the fifth building built for Harvard uh, and the seventh building in which Harvard, uh, which Harvard used. Um, it perpetrated the, or it really formed this idea that Harvard would be a three-sided quadrangle looking out in a very public way towards the common, not inwardly towards what we now think of as the yard. And the placement of these beautiful shell-like windows that have, were, were later, later removed, but you can find them in Newport, shown on the print, and of the clock facing outward shows you some sense of the public stance of Harvard. This quad was then duplicated on the north with the building of Holden Chapel in 1742 and then in the 1760s of Hollis Hall, uh, providing another small three-sided courtyard, again looking out at the uh, common. Holden Chapel is a favorite of mine and I love to take students there and say, don't you realize you're in the oldest really contained part of Harvard that to your left is a building of 1742, to your right is a building of where John Harvard's library still existed for 20 more years after that, and most students I know never even get to this little hidden part of Harvard. The strength of Harvard's buildings was not in the unified plan of Columbia, but in the fact that buildings were able to turn from back to front. What had been the back would become the front, and then as we'll see there were two powerful buildings which were from the beginning double-sided. Um, 
The chapel, uh, of course, faced the common, that's to say where the red arrow is, and that's where the original facade was, but it was turned around, uh, that door was blocked, is still blocked, you can't open that door, and you eventually get to the other facade, a wonderful twin, but a false twin, and it's the connoisseurs, well, it's the students I want to open their eyes, that when you look at one facade, you have real Doric capitals, and you look at the other, well, it's a back facade, it's not really meant to be complete. But the line generated by Holden, will become a dominant line for the rest of the Harvard Yard. Uh, you notice the pump back there. It, pumps and latrines and privies and pigsties and so forth are all the marks of the back of a building. And this indeed was the back of these two buildings. And it's the back's ability to turn into front which is important. For instance, if you look at the main door of Hollis West, the door facing uh, the common, it's a beautifully elaborate Corinthian door, and you look at the other side, which we now think of as the front of the building, you realize how much simpler it is. Now, here's what happened to the original quad. At first, Harvard Hall burned in 1764, destroying John Harvard's library. Then it was replaced r relatively rapidly with the building that's still there, although you hardly see it under all the additions, Harvard Hall III. Then the Stoughton building was demolished, it was so rickety, it had been even affected by the Lisbon earthquake, apparently, which reached Harvard, and somehow it was a good thing because the walls were so leaning that the earthquake straightened the walls, but nonetheless, uh, it disappeared, and then uh, the idea finally was to have no building at all, but to construct University Hall, one of the most beautiful buildings. Charles Bullfinch had the fantastic idea of the double facaded building. This is the west facade facing the common, and the almost identical east facade, except it had no granite staircases and was much simpler, and the privies and so forth were all back there again. Bullfinch's idea was marvelous, to surround it with a group of trees uh, to make it really the center of the new college. Some randomly placed buildings began to uh, move, um, let's say, migrate east. Gore Hall, the library, um, was set in a picturesque uh, landscape like Andrew Jackson Downing or, or that sort of thing. Uh, the wonderful print here was used uh, on the plaque that's now on Widener Library, right down to the top hats of the little figures. And since the building was the newest building in Cambridge or at Harvard, when Cambridge was incorporated as a city in 1846, it's become the symbol of the city of Cambridge, and it's on the seal wherever you find it, as you know. Uh, it faced Massachusetts Avenue, and the temptation was always to have a library facing Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, the gate built by the class of 1977, which means either in 1902 or 1907, 25 or 30 years later is the gate of misplaced expectations because it was in 1909 that the corporation decided that the new library, whatever it was, would not face Massachusetts Avenue but would make a theater, so to speak, facing the inside of the yard. The other building somewhat randomly placed, well not quite randomly placed, is the Gothic Chapel of 1856 of course, demolished now for a memorial church, but put right on line of Holden Chapel. And that line, going through Appleton Chapel, would eventually give the line of Robinson Hall, which would make the final quadrangle on the eastern side. Now, how to expand into the east? If you took the original quadrangle, the yellow lines show it, it would have been too small. Um, if you took uh, University Hall and made a twin, it also would have been too small. Um, there was a kind of quandary. And finally, uh, what's happening is that the much larger uh, axis of Holden Chapel and Mass Hall will determine the quadrangle on the east. First comes Richardson. And Richardson's massive, wonderful Seaver Hall of 18, late 70s and 1880 will determine the rest of the building and the campus. It's a wonderful two-sided building, as you can see, with slight differences. Uh, for instance, the beautiful arched door facing the yard is very different from the classical door facing what's now the Fogg Museum. But otherwise, it's double-sided. And from the office of Richardson, we have an amazing plan that shows that three, not, not only would we have had Seaver, but three other turreted castles in the Romanesque style would have made the boundary of the campus on Quincy Street. Um, it would have been the best, largest assembly of Richardson buildings uh, in Massachusetts, rivaling uh, the famous set of Richardson's, five Richardson buildings in Northeastern Mass. But it didn't happen, thanks to the arrival of Charles Fallon McKim, who, um, 
built the fence, which is really what gives the yard its definition and is a wonderful thing to look at. We seldom do, but we pass through it many times every day. And part of my goal is to get the students, well, for instance, to see that it was given by many classes, all of whom are listed. And the way you get the date of the fence, or that portion of the fence, is you add either 25 or 30, depending on when the Alumni Association hit that class up. Uh, so a 70 will give you a fence of 95 or 1900 and so on. Um, some gates, of course, were paid for by, not by alumni classes. The, uh, the McKean Gate, opposite the Porcellian Club, is wonderful for lovers of Florence because it brings the fantastic uh, mannerist Porcellino, the origin of Porcellian, onto Harvard's, into Harvard's sculptural repertoire. The biggest and best is the Johnston Gate, 12 huge piers paid for by Mr. Johnston of Chicago. But the best place, if you look on the left and the right, you'll see uh, these inscriptions here and here. Best place to learn about the history of Harvard, as I hope students will, that it was founded by the general, best to learn the facts, but then to remember the omissions. Founded by the general court, 1636. It doesn't say it was supposed to be in, in uh, Salem. Um, then ordered to be at Newton. Well, why at Newton? Well, because Anne Hutchinson was creating so much trouble in Boston that you could preach without going to the university. They said, let's not put it in Boston either. We'll put it in Newton. So it was changed to Cambridge and then finally changed to Harvard College, as you know. And on the other side, this wonderful text, New England's First Fruits, is the missionary pamphlet sent back to the Society for the Propagation of the Faith in uh, the Gospel in New England, sent back to England because they were generous with the idea that Indians, or Native Americans, would be educated in this college. Uh, the Johnson Gate has another thing that often slips below the threshold of our consciousness, namely bad brick making in the colonial era often burned the bricks. And that was imitated by McKim in a marvelous way, which is now called Harvard Brick, go to Widener, and so forth, you can find it. Other things that the fence do that we forget is it gave uh, water to students and, of course, to passing horses, which were still going on Kirkland Street in the first decade of the century, such as this lovely fountain of 1907 on the left. Um, and this fountain, the Lion Fountain, just opposite the firehouse with a huge trough, in, in a big excedra, and I often ask myself, what is this excedra doing uh, with the two openings, not in the center, but on either, on, and then I said, well, let's take away Canada, see what happens. There's the old fog on the right and this excedra on the left, and there's Canada blocking everything in a very insensitive 1970s way. But if you look at where those lines of sight went, one went to the tower of the old chapel, still there in 19. Seven. And the other one on the left, the one that goes straight, goes all the way across campus and winds up under the later Wigglesworth and winds up at this wonderful Dexter Gate where if you go into the Dexter Gate, you say, enter to grow in wisdom. And if you leave the Dexter Gate, you say, depart to serve better thy country and thy kind. All of this was connected visually right across campus, now blocked by planting and by Pusey and by, of course, the terrible candidate. Back to uh, the Richardson Quadrangle. Uh, on the left, you had Emerson Hall, built around 1900, but the money for Emerson came not from those philosophers who are so proudly trumpeted in the uh, inscription, but from something called the Department of uh, Social, uh, not Social Thought, what is it? Um, social Ethics, which was highly endowed. In fact, it brought in the money. Uh, Francis Greenwood Peabody's friendly donors brought in the money not only for the building, but for something called the Social Museum uh, in Emerson Hall. And uh, this is what that was like, a study which we would now think of as something like social work or social ethics. Um, beautifully uh, cataloged recently in an exhibit in the Fogg Museum. And on the right, Robinson Hall, which all of our uh, history students, we've just heard about this, go in thinking it's history until they look up and say it's architecture, uh, built by H. Langford Warren. And my hobby at the moment is to find the sources of all of these wonderful reliefs on the idea that every learned person at the time would have said these are all pretty obvious. They're part of the baggage of culture that we all carry with us, like this famous sarcophagus now in the Vatican, or uh, the wonderful inscriptions all from Pompeii, when you think of the McKim firm trying to do inscriptions. In any case, uh, uh, what happened to this um, uh, enterprise? The, uh, showing you some of the things. Um, 
an epistemological, three epistemological changes exiled all of the collecting that was going on at this end of the campus. Uh, in the old Fogg Museum, the idea was no longer castes, it was full of castes, and the wave of castes swept through America in the 1890s, but the real thing, how many of those statues are real? Only the Warren Torso, which is now in the Fogg Museum, and the idea was authentic art, not caste, will be the teaching of the future, which was the philosophy of the new Fogg. The social museum was swept away by the introduction of scientific sociology, which resented as a department the presence of social ethics and gradually exiled the museum and absorbed it into itself in the 1930s. And finally, just as the Smolny convent in St. Petersburg was the place where Lenin hatched the Bolshevik revolution, so too uh, uh, Robinson Hall was the place where the course of architecture in education in America and in building would be changed drastically as the new uh, dean, uh, Hudnut, arrived uh, sweeping away all those castes, hiring Gropius, and introducing an entirely different philosophy of education. The east end of the campus, so full of collections, after the 1930s would have no collections anymore. Thank you. It's very dangerous to invite people like uh, Joseph Connors and myself to give talks on topics that we would actually like three days uh, to take up. So um, I gave a good bit of thought to how I would talk about the trees of Harvard Yard uh, and decided to largely tell it from uh, the position of first person singular, as I realized in preparing this in a way that I hadn't before, that slowly uh, up until 19, up, up until 2007, when President Faust looked at me and said, Oh, I understand you're the curator of the landscape of Harvard Yard, I realized sort of over a 25 year period, I had. Uh, kind of unwittingly taking, taken on a responsibility of thinking of all of this. Um, Joe asked me where we got the colored picture that he was showing in black and white, and I told him on the internet. I don't think he f found that a very suitable answer. Um, but uh, my young assistant um, uh, found this image to start with, and one of the questions that I wanted to think about relative to collecting is the uh, things that are living like landscape is the nature of the entity that collects them and the frame that they're collected in and, uh, and, and why they were collected. Uh, and I, th I think Joe did a wonderful job of uh, actually showing me things about the yard I had never seen, but I can't help but think about the significance of uh, the early, we, one presumes that there is some accuracy, although one never knows with these engravers because they took great liberty uh, on landscape. Uh, there probably was a tree there, um, and it probably was an elm, but it is the beginning of a very huge problem for Harvard that happens uh, with the arrival of the Dutch elm disease and the fact that the yard, which I'm going to explain in a minute, was almost a monoculture of trees that were destined to either go into decline or die, or at least to be trees that would not significantly ever be replanted because of the inability of this species to survive with the disease that we have. Um, the yard, as a as a place where trees have been collected in the contemporary sense is largely three spaces, um, the old yard, the tercentenary, and the seaver. And um, this is roughly what Harvard looked like in the middle of the 20th century, and you can find no fault with the original formers of Harvard Yard thinking that American elm would be a beautiful tree to have in the yard. It was fast growing, strong, 
easy to transplant, widely available, long-lived, and magnificent. But it also has a natural habit that would come to define a quality that the yard has, which is the self-limbing of the lower branches so that over time you get this very unique quality of a very high canopy and columns of the tree coming down into the space, which is going to become one of my problems in the early 90s when we decided to replant those. Uh, Joe also talked about, I, I love now understanding how, why I'm confused when I look at the history of the campus that certain halls seem to be in different locations. They would build one, tear it down, <laughs> build another one in a new location and just use the same name someplace else. Um, but the John Harvard statue um, was for a very long time by Memorial Church and moved into the yard uh, right at this sort of heyday of the period of American Elms. Um, I actually discovered this photograph um, while staying at the faculty club uh, uh, in New York City, or the Harvard Club, it's not the faculty club, but as an assistant professor, but there was a period in time where Harvard actually moved in a new, almost an entire replanting of the American Elm population that is in that, this, by the way, I think you can tell, rather unusual size to be moving trees. Um, so just to give you a, a glimpse of the importance of trees in the early history of the yard, in, in the, I mean in the recent uh, early history. So some dispute on the internet, and I'm no expert, as to when Dutch Elm arrived. Uh, Cornell says 1930, um, other sources say 1950, but by, and it was in Buffalo, New York, and so very quickly, that disease spread in all directions uh, and eventually uh, resulted in many trees being lost. Um, so I have actually worked on collecting trees in the yard for, f for four different presidents and twice for Derek Bach when after President Summers um, left, there was a period of time where, where he was acting president. Um, my own, I, I arrived in 82, in 89, Peter Del Tredici and I were asked by the president to be on a committee to anticipate the replanting of the yard. It was sort of a, the kind of thing that you did as a young professor. I mean, I mean for one, among other things, that when the president asks you to do things before you're tenured, you do. Um, and if you're nice, you continue to do it after you're tenured. But then when um, Neil Rudenstein arrived from the lush Princeton campus, um, he hired my firm to do a master plan to radically re-landscape uh, in the vegetative sense of the yard, and we produced a master plan uh, for the replanting of 250 trees in the first five years of the 90s under, under the time when Neil was here, and that was in this 1993 master plan. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit or we're gonna run out of time. So it's hard um, to remember, for those of you that were not here, that by the early 90s, the old yard was um, almost half empty of trees, that elm trees were being removed and there was a total deer in the headlights quality among everybody of knowing that the elms couldn't be replaced, but what would be done. And so we started doing an inventory, for instance, here. Um, you can see um, how few trees there were in the space that I call the Seaver Quad, which I think of as being completed across Quincy Street by the fog, by the way. And then how we would propose to replant that, um, for instance, Another thing that I did it was a willful act, which is, I think, actually something very common to collectors, which is that they get to exercise things that they have developed their own beliefs about. But I, or we, my office and I, chose to commemorate the, 
entrances to the yard all the way around by paring trees that restated the point of entry. And that was something that I had seen in the remnants of the Olmsted brothers' replanting of the yard done elsewhere. There wasn't really any more legitimacy beyond that than I had seen its value, but also there seemed to be this interesting palimpsest of entries which had existed and which had been closed and which I wanted to draw new attention to by pairing trees at the entry. So this is actually a, a, a male and female uh, Kentucky coffee tree um, right after it was planted in 93, and this is um, Matt Moffat's photograph that he took just a day ago of seeing how that pair of trees is growing. So, you know, as a person who was teaching plants at the time, uh, through the early 90s to the Graduate School of Design, and with the decision that we were not going to replace the trees in the yard with another monoculture, Dan Kiley later, later wrote to me after we did it, and his letter was, Dear Michael, you have ruined Harvard Yard, Dan. Um, but for instance, for those of you that know Smith, where they elected to do it with Zelkova and, and Illinois, where it was done with honey locust, there have been similar, not at Smith, but at Illinois, similar consequential losses of monocultures. And so we made a decision partly as a collection for students to study but also as a way of creating something more ecologically sustainable to, to plant, replant the yard with 30 species. Um, to, um, in certain spaces, such as at the, um, at the end of Seaver and Robinson, we chose to introduce plants that were actually, in some ways, I'll be kind and say unusual to the yard, which was to introduce a of planting of four metasequoias, but recognizing Harvard's presence in, um, in contemporary horticultural history of introducing that tree uh, from China. And then another thing that happened was the Cambridge Historical Commission um, wanted us to commemorate the fact that the privies in the yard had been planted uh, in Charles Sullivan's sense with pines to screen them and then allowed to grow up. And he wanted that kind of homage to the primordial forest, but also to that very pragmatic and quirky bit of history of pines being in the yard for screening and then being allowed to grow up. So those were replanted. Um, so I'm a little bit over my time. How much longer do you not want me to talk? <laughs> Two minutes? OK. Um, my drawing, actually, of the tercentenary, but explaining one of, the, uh, one of the central ideas, which was that the middle of the space um, would have um, trees with lighter foliage and bring the sense of brightness and definition of the center. So we did use honey locust with its sort of dapple light. And then a stronger reiteration of the perimeter with geometry. Uh, and, and a number of red maples, and then, um, which is very funny, the planting of uh, yellow woods to coincide with graduation um, around the first week in May when it no longer happens. <laughs> um, and so the yellow woods live on beautifully, and I lovingly remember back in the day when they bloomed during graduation, and it's just another one of those marks in history that's a I guess another aspect of collecting, uh, which is that decisions are made for one reason um, and then it, that changes. So that's what the trees look like on the top after we planted them and then on the bottom, the yellow woods have um, done extremely well and filled in. Um, we were very barren of trees by the early 90s um, and then the replanting of those. And then I guess I'll just make one other point and then run through the slides. What we observed had been done historically was that when trees that were not elms were introduced into um, the yard, uh, arborists and I suppose maybe landscape architects 
had made the decision to remove the lower branches. And the identity of trees is very much through their form, among obviously their leaves and other things. And so this is actually a, a, a recent photograph. You can see one of my white pines in the distant planted and growing up. Um, you can see American elms and red oaks looking very similar because the lower branches have been removed from the red oaks to make them more like elms, which is what the tree on the right is, because there still are many elms in the yard. But as a strategy, we have taken the collection, which has ecological diversity, and working with the amazing people who run the grounds department and slowly are removing branches so that that vaulted and lifted feeling that the elms had um, as a monoculture or nearly as a monoculture um, is today complemented with um, the others. I'll just go through these so that you've seen them. Um, I wanted to end on, I think, one of the really major changes. Uh, when Drew became president, I told her I, I told her I hoped I could walk around with her that summer when things settled down and explain what we'd been doing in the yard. And she turned to me and said, you know, if if I could grant you one wish, that isn't exactly what she said, but it was kind of what she said. If I could do one thing for you, what would it be? And I, would, and I said, I think it would be great to bring in this guy, T. Fleischer, who is working on how biologically to reinvigorate the soil and the grass of the yard, but that in so doing, by changing the chemistry and the biology of the soil, I think we would lengthen the likelihood of the, of the trees as a collection sustaining longer. And she did. That she just, and it was a switch that was actually ready to be thrown in the politics of the university. But um, we have one of the greenest campuses in America because of, of, of that decision that Drew made. So anyway, thank you. Next Monday, there's going to be an unveiling of my most recent portrait commissioned by the Harvard Foundation. The portrait honors contributions and accomplishments of the United States Treasurer Rosa Rios, a 1987 graduate of Winthrop House, where the portrait will hang. Rios has led a distinguished career in regional economic development, and while at Harvard, she played a critical role in the creation of the Harvard Foundation, which is dedicated to improving uh, cultural diversity relations at Harvard. Her senior thesis was on changing notions of Latino identity. To my knowledge, of about 700 painted portraits at Harvard, uh, her portrait will be the first of a Latino, and certainly the first of a Latino woman. I'd, I'd show you the portrait, but it's an unveiling, and I can't. <laughs> um, the setting of the portrait is her treasury office facing the White House with a treasurer's flag of 1789 hanging beside her. And behind Ms. Rios is the desk given to Amer the American treasurer by the country of France in colonial times. And in her portrait, she looks out at the viewer with confidence, but approachability and encouragement uh, to the students that it will walk by the portrait in Winthrop House. It does look mo different from most portraits at Harvard, and it is supposed to. It's supposed to get attention and have something to say. The unveiling will be a great event. Members of the family will be there, probably some people from Washington as well. And members of Harvard's Latino Student Alliance will play a major role, thrilled that a member of their community will finally find a place on Harvard's walls. At unveilings, tears flow and emotions run high. But I also know that this event is just the beginning of the life cycle of a portrait at Harvard. Portraits last much longer than people's memories, Portraits last longer than rooms in most Harvard buildings, and even longer than most Harvard buildings, as you've heard. This creates an obvious problem. Because where a portrait is hung at a university is often an integral part of the portrait itself. Spatial associations are almost always a vivid component of any unveiling. Moving portraits around, which universities must do for any number of reasons, breaks those associations. This is Belinda Randall, 
1816 to 1897. She was part of an important family in Stowe, Massachusetts. She and her brother were acquainted with Emerson, Thoreau, and Margaret Fuller, and she was an early subscriber to Fuller's conversations. Just before her death, Ms. Randall bequeathed to Harvard funds to create a badly needed new dining hall for students at the college. This is Randall Hall. It was constructed at the corner of Divinity Ave and Kirkland Street, and it served as a dining hall for about 20 years, after which it became the home of Harvard University Press. And in 1930, the Storer family gave this portrait of Belinda Randall, painted in 1840 to Harvard, to hang in Randall Hall. However, in 1963, Randall Hall was demolished, and it's now where William James Hall is. The portrait of Belinda Randall was moved to the faculty club, but when the faculty club was renovated, the interior decorator in charge was heard to comment and to cry the seemingly random portraits on the walls. Uh, she described them as shabby chic, and the portrait of Ms. Randall was sent to storage, the likely final stop for this portrait in its life as a university portrait. If Randall's portraitist had become famous, however, the outcome might have been different. John Singer Sargent was in Boston working on the Boston Public Library uh, murals when he received a commission to paint a portrait of a Civil War veteran who had donated money so that Harvard could create a new dining hall, also a new dining hall, but this one would be specifically for poor students. The new dining hall became the Harvard Union, where I ate as a freshman, and the veteran was Henry Lee Higginson. It was grateful Harvard students who commissioned Sargent to create the portrait. Higginson's imposing portrait hung in the Union for many years and survived extensive remodeling. Recently, though, it was moved to the recently reopened Harvard Art Museum. The work by Sargent had become an enormously important piece of art, art, uh, art history and become extremely valuable. And such works in public areas are vulnerable to accidental damage and worse. But moving it changed the story. In its new home, the portrait is not about the remarkable generosity repaid by grateful students. It is now about the skill of the portraitist and the emotion associated with the Civil War blanket resting in Higginson's lap. Moving portraits is common, and stories change accordingly. Harvard commissioned John Singleton Copley in the 1770s to create three portraits of Thomas Hollis, Thomas Hancock, and Nicholas Boylson. However, with the remodeling of Harvard Hall, there was no space for such large works, much less for three large works all hung together. And by the way, the three were supposed to hang in Harvard Hall to recognize the, don the donation of three professorships among, I think it's the first three uh, professorships at Harvard. Well, at Harvard Hall, when it was remodeled, couldn't handle it. And the car frames had become too fragile and delicate. And so the three were relocated to new locations around the campus. Hollis and Hancock went to a Harvard House dining room. Boylston to the Countway Library at Harvard Medical School, where they are right now, I cannot say. A wonderful portrait of Nicholas Boylston on the end does hang in the Harvard Art Museum, newly reopened, and it's a wonderful painting, but it is not the one commissioned by Harvard for endowing a professorship. The message of Harvard's gratitude for financial support has been lost, at least for now. The portrait you see in the museum is an earlier portrait of Boylston that Copley used while creating the Harvard Commission portrait because by then Boylston had died. So you can see it's the same image and Copley did his own version of Photoshop to create the later portrait. My fervent hope is that the Harvard Art Museum someday reunites the three and retells again the reason for their existence at Harvard I think we owe that to the three generous donors. A few years ago, I had personal involvement in relocating a portrait at Harvard. The Harvard Foundation commissioned me to create a posthumous portrait of Professor Anna Marie Schimmel, a distinguished Islamic scholar and poet. Professor Schimmel is a prolific scholar, teacher, and uh, she wrote more than 100 books 
during her scholarly career, 100 books and monographs. Professor Schimmel spent many years living in Elliott House, and the master uh, of Elliott House thought it was a natural place for her portrait to hang. The, the uh, students were extremely eager, uh, the Islamic community with the idea of having a portrait go up in Elliott House, one that included, in fact, uh, I, I put um, uh, Arabic calligraphy in the background, uh, readable by uh, students who, who knew Arabic and had studied it. The problem was there's no room on the walls in the Elliott House Library. And the decision was made to replace the only portrait of a non-housemaster, a portrait of Professor Walter Jackson Bate, a, whose humanities course I took and loved at Harvard. He died in 1999. Professor Bate was the winner of two Pulitzer Prizes, an outstanding scholar and teacher. My portrait of outstanding scholar, Anna Marie Schimmel, now hangs in the spot occupied by outstanding scholar, Walter Jackson Bate. This was just a no-win situation. Universities simply do not have room to honor all those who deserve to be honored. And by a wide margin, this is the fundamental, relentless heartbreak of university portraits. And the heartbreak gets worse as walls become glass, ceilings become lower, security for art becomes more problematic and expensive, and renovators spur shabby chic portraiture for minimalist, low-maintenance, renovated university walls. Professor Schimmel's portrait now hangs in Elliott House Library. To prepare for today's session, I went looking for an image of Professor Bates' portrait so I could show it to you. One might hope that the scarcity of space on university walls might be remedied by seemingly infinite space to display university portraits with their full story on the web. Here's what I found. There are no good images of Professor Bates' portrait anywhere that I could find anywhere on the web. Uh, I couldn't find it at the Harvard Art Museum site. I couldn't find it at the artist site. Nowhere. I find this disturbing. I was not expecting to discover this further ignominy of an end-of-cycle status for a university portrait, an online memorial consisting only of a low-resolution black-and-white portrait, uh, black-and-white photograph. I don't mean to say that there aren't portraits, fortunate portraits that are well documented and inspire and instruct us in great places such as the faculty room. And it turns out the Department of Astronomy uh, in the philosophy department, uh, I, I think this is maybe because the astronomy department never moved because of a telescope. And I don't think uh, the philosophy department moved because you don't move philosophers. Um, these fortunate portraits have escaped another uh, unfortunate end to a university portrait, uh, and a, one I would call anonymity. I visit Harvard buildings and Harvard houses often, and quite often. I'm deeply saddened when I see portraits that have no label, no attribution, no description of why portrait was commissioned or hung. This is because these portraits are refugees of Harvard buildings that have been repurposed. Or they are the result of unveilings that were never quite completed with proper labeling, a very common problem and now a bit worse since the Harvard Art Museum eliminated the position of portrait curator when the fog was closed for renovation. Unlabeled portraits say little to students other than suggesting that Harvard has a history. And unlabeled portraits encourage and condone ignoring university portraits altogether. I find this a troubling message to give students about the value of history and learning, not to mention respect for the contributions of others. Facing the fact that university portraits must confront a challenging life cycle is not all that dissimilar to what we face in life itself. I mean, we all know that in life we come, we live, and then most of us are forgotten. So apparently, too, with portraits. But the high irony here is that the whole idea of portraits was that they were supposed to change that. In the face of this, as a portraitist, I still try to fight back, to defy that life cycle. I try to make my portraits interesting. I try to tell my subject's story, how they contributed to Harvard and to humanity as a whole, as clearly as I can 
I just want to make these university artifacts, like the portrait of Rosa Rios, worth keeping around. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. I, I, I don't, I'm trying to recall if I've ever been able to say of a panel I've been involved in that it was a kind of uh, campus-altering experience to, to, to hear and witness, uh, but I think that's the case for this panel. I, um, uh, I wanted to thank our speakers, and I just had um, one very brief uh, question that I thought we'd start off the discussion with to may, maybe tie them together, which is that all of you in your own ways have thought about uh, different perspectives on the way the campus is oriented. Uh, the way uh, sight lines and the experience of the campus are conditioned through axes of, of passage and entry and so forth. Uh, but taking the spirit of uh, Stephen Coit's presentation and asking our other two presenters uh, from their perspectives to comment on uh, whether there are um, objects such as portraits, other kinds of objects which aren't necessarily usually associated with a built environment or with an urbanistic function, which do play uh, an urbanistic role in orienting or conditioning uh, our experience of the campus that aren't necessarily uh, infrastructure buildings or the yard. Uh, would any of you care to comment on this? Well, all I can say is that I, uh, for this talk and all before, I've been trying to find portraits of buildings. Um, <laughs> and it's a wonderful custom at Harvard when you tear down a building to put a plaque on it which has a portrait of the previous building. Uh, and uh, so Gore Hall or uh, Appleton Chapel are both represented on their successors. And I hope uh, this has continued as a custom. I'm not sure this is answering the question, but in two years, Winthrop House is going to be remodeled. And it's the, I think it's the third house, that's, uh, fourth house that will be remodeled. And I don't think that portraits and where they will hang have ever figured in a remodeling. And to consciously not leave room for history seems to be, doesn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's interesting about the unplanned campus at Harvard, right? It's perpetually in turmoil and change and replanning and master plans don't have a very long life, but every time something changes, it has these invisible uh, ripple effects with other kinds of objects which get dispersed in ways that we haven't fully uh, perhaps appreciated. Uh, well, in the spirit of that, uh, I wanted to kind of open the floor to, uh, to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we have a Q&A, we have a mic set up in the central aisle, so we ask you to just identify yourself and your affiliation when you ask your question. Thank you, please. Thank you, hi. Oh. Great. Um, hi, I'm Abigail Weil. I'm a graduate student in the Slavic department. Thank you all so much for three fascinating presentations. I want to propose an answer to your question. Um, there's a collection of bike racks around the university. They're all very different. Some of them are more useful than others because of their design, but also because of where they're located next to the building. Um, the ones outside the Science Center are spacious and inviting, but there's little ones tucked away next to Lamont, which open out onto a street that you can't ride your bike down, so something to keep <laughs> in mind. Um, I have a question for Professor Connors. I wonder if you could um, comment on the history and the eclectic style of Memorial Church. Um, Memorial Chapel, is that what it's called? Um, uh, chapel, uh, church it's called, actually. It's, it's pretty big, so I don't yeah. think of it as a chapel. But also, um, I was very struck by what you said about how the earlier planning of Harvard took into account the relationships between the different buildings, site lines. Um, and I wonder if you can comment on the extent to which say, the Brutalist Science Center interacts with Memorial Church? <laughs> well, uh, just a few things. Uh, the church is a brilliant building in a way. Uh, with students, I say, picture uh, the Parthenon, and then picture the spire of Old South Church, and put the latter on the former. <laughs> and they'd say, you're crazy. But that's exactly what's happening uh, in Memorial Church. And it gives the university a center seen from miles away. It's brilliant in that sense. Uh, the, the two porches, one creating the theater and one the real entrance, is also brilliant. The memorial, the World War I memorial inside the um, north, what would be, no, the south, the, the, main, the main porch, 
uh, must be an amazing structure because that huge uh, bell tower is right over the open space. It must be an incredible truss of steel in there. So all sorts of wonderful things are going on in that. I really love that building, actually. It's on the same line. Uh, in little Holden Chapel determines where it is. That little chapel determined, and there was a direct link, visual link, between the old Appleton Chapel and Holden Chapel until terrible, brutal, really ugly and unpleasant Thayer was built in uh, 1869, <laughs> and that blocked the idea of that visual link. Um, uh, the gates, I, I spoke about the gates, and one of those gates, well, I have a picture I didn't show, but you take it from near the chapel, and it looks out at what looks like a um, tremendous tarantula <laughs> coming <laughs> in your direction. And I learned uh, that the, just yesterday that the um, after Memorial Hall was burnt in the 1950s and the tower burnt, there was something of a policy of let it rot uh, so that it would someday be seem just about right to pull this terribly ugly uh, Victorian monster down. And a new sci a, a twin of the science building or something like that would have been built there. So that didn't happen, and you can see how buildings outlive their taste, and uh, Rudenstein's re repairing or re restoring of the Tower Memorial Hall is kind of a sea change uh, in the re-evaluation of a building. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. I see a, f a fellow faculty director of the Radcliffe yes. Institute you in do. line. Yes. Janet Rich Edwards. I'm here at Radcliffe and also Harvard Medical School. And my question is for Professor Coit. Um, the biggest collection- Art, Artist Coit. Ah, oh, there you go. Um, the biggest collection of portraits of which I'm aware are in the Bornstein Auditorium at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Right. Um, and it's a fabulous, very rich collection of portraits. But like many female faculty members, we feel oppressed by the fact that I think only one out of there must be 50 is a woman. And so my question for you is you get this almost Malthusian problem of, you know, all these portraits and no space. How do you think about making room for new and more diverse generations while preserving the history? Uh, fortunately, most of the time, it's not my problem. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, my, as, as the artist for the Harvard Foundation, we are to bring diversity to the walls of Harvard that better reflects students and the faculty they, they see every day, and so we've done uh, people of color, Asians, women, Sri Lankans, Japanese, to, to bring that diversity. Um, the, the problem of where you hang them is, is the big problem. And I say with a, only a little small glibness that any of you could commission a portrait at Harvard. That's easy. What's really hard is finding the place to put it. And that is a, a, a decision that is fraught with uh, 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 disagreements about who owns space. And I'm sure in that, in that space, you would find several entities that believe they command the decision of what portrait goes where and, and interests will be protected. It's, it's a serious problem. And, and actually one I would welcome some, some better clarity on because the choice of what portraits you put up is, is a little like some of the library decisions we heard in the earlier panel. Um, how do you make these decisions to preserve learning, to, to, to record history, and, and given that, that shelf space, wall space is limited, how do you do that? And it's a deeply, it's a deep pedagogical decision that should be made, not through infighting, but by uh, thinking about it. I never like to seriously hear anyone um, feel oppressed. Um, but I do want to reflect that the absence of women in those portraits is an important reflection of history um, and a bad one. Um, and we should be careful not to forget that um, women have not perhaps had the place even still in this university that they deserve. I teach in a department that has only tenured two women in its 110 year history, which is shocking in a field where women have played as important a role in landscape architecture as they have. 
and 70% of our students today are female. Um, but your comment makes me remember how important collections are in terms of what they sometimes inadvertently reflect. Well, I, I just wanted to say I was once in an analogous situation to Stevens where uh, as director of the American Academy in Rome, I was ex officio on the board of something called the, we call erroneously the Protestant cemetery, really it's the <laughs> non-Catholic cemetery, because you can have Orthodox, you can have atheists and so on in it, but the non-Catholic cemetery. cemetery. And uh, being that. in use and people wanting to be buried there, but it's a limited plot of land, our committee was called the Tenure Committee. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if you were John Keats or if you were Gramsci, you, you got tenure. But if you had that wonderful weeping cherub, you might get tenure too. <laughs> Otherwise, people had to depart. All right, we have time for one final question. Please go ahead. My name is Kanchi Gandhi. I am from Harvard University Herbaria, which has the largest number of specimens, more than 5.4 million specimens. As one of the former deans said, that's the largest one on, of any collections on campus. Anyway, my question is about the Harvard yard trees. You know, the maples and oaks are common anywhere and everywhere. I, was, I have been always curious about this Kentucky coffee plant, why that plant was chosen, because it is, it's quite uncommon. Any particular reason it was planted there? Because I taught plants at Harvard and I wanted a place where my students could go and see it. <laughs> it's a, absolutely as naive as what I said, which was, I, I mean, truthfully, at the time, it's a tree that's used extensively in my practice, but it's a tree that with age has a structure naturally that's not unlike the American elm. So besides my desire for it to be there so I could walk up to it with my students and point, it, it is considered by some as a significant tree that had been underappreciated in its history. Perhaps I gave it too prominent a location, I don't know. Well, I'd like you to join me in thanking our, our three speakers for this wonderful panel. Thank you very much.